joining us for today's online conversation on the challenge of Christian nationalism with Mark Knoll and Vince Bacote. We're really glad to have you here. I want to especially thank our partners in this effort, our collaborators at the Center for Public Justice and the Institute for Faith and Public Life at AEI, ably led by Stephanie Summers and Tyler Castle, respectively. It's a real pleasure to get to collaborate with friends on the first of what's going to be a three-part series that looks at not only today's topic, the challenge of Christian nationalism, uh, but also the challenges facing religious freedom in a polarized era and new forms of Christian public engagement. So we hope that you'll tune in for each of those. The topic that we're discussing today can be a controversial and confusing one, as well as a vitally important one. The horrifying events of January 6, when the entire world watched as some of those who stormed the Capitol, erected crosses and prayed in the Senate chamber, dramatically illustrates the ways in which Christian symbols have been instrumentalized and fused to nationalistic and political ends. But if those events of the January 6 insurrection represented a shocking extreme, many of the ideas or the assumptions that characterize Christian nationalism, including the conflation of Christian identity with American identity, or the belief that the US has a religiously covenantal relationship and is the new Israel, are fairly widespread and have acceptance among many people of faith so much so that they might not even be recognized as nationalistic, much less debated or questioned. So how do we understand and grapple with the question of Christian nationalism? How do we learn to recognize and wisely respond to, it, to its distortions? And how do we distinguish living out one's faith in the public square with instrumentalizing faith for political ends? All of these questions form a daunting task and one that's often elicited more heat than light, more reaction than reflection. So I am particularly delighted to welcome to today's conversation two guests who are among the most respected, thoughtful, and insightful scholars of American Christianity of their time, Mark Knoll and Vince Bacote. Mark Knoll is a renowned historian whose scholarship over the course of his distinguished career has focused on the history of Christianity in the United States. He's an emeritus member of two history departments at two different universities, both Wheaton College and the University of Notre Dame, a member of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a recipient of the National Humanities Medal, bestowed by the President of the United States for Excellence in the Humanities. His many works include the award-winning book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, God and Race in American Politics, A Short History, The Civil War as Theological Crisis, and In the Beginning Was the Word, The Bible in American Public Life. Joining him is Vincent Bacote. Vince is the Associate Professor of Theology and the Director of the Center for Applied Christian Ethics at Wheaton College. He's a member of the Evangelical Theological Society and the Society of Christian Ethics, and is also a regular columnist for Comet Magazine, as well as writing for a broad swath of other journals, including Books and Culture, Christianity Today, Christian Scholars Review, and many others. He's also the author of The Political Disciple, A Theology of Public Life, Reckoning with Race and Performing the Good News, and the spirit in public theology, appropriating the legacy of Abraham Kuyper, as well as a contributor to many other works. So Mark and Vince, welcome. Thank you, great to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thank so you. we're gonna dive right in with what seems like an easy question, but can actually be quite a thorny one, which is what is Christian nationalism? How would you define it or describe it? And is it a set of ideas or a theological construct or more a set of attitudes? So Mark, we'll start with you on that one. Yes, a very good place to begin. I think I'd start by trying to distinguish between responsible Christian patriotism and what might be called damaging or destructive Christian nationalism. Responsible Christian patriots love their country but also realize that God's standards of right and wrong must apply to my country as well, to, as well as to all the countries of, of the world. In contrast, um, Christian nationalists are often those who love their country right or wrong, 
and who refuse to allow any criticism of its history. Responsible Christian patriots try to show how Christianity can be a service to the nation. Extreme nationalists make Christianity a servant of the nation. Maybe a contrast can make the distinction even sharper. Responsible Christian patriotism expresses confident loyalty along with the capacity for self-criticism. Damaging or destructive Christian nationalism expresses fearful loyalty with a compulsion to demonize op opponents. But then it's really important to make a contextual statement that these are polar opposites with a lot of ambiguous gray areas in between, particularly because, Sherry, as you, you mentioned, it, Christian nationalism is really not a, a sharply focused thing, but a series of loosely defined ideological positions. Let me add uh, one thing to that I, in terms of, sort of a short way to sort of illustrate that, right? If you think about the cross, right, patriotism rightly construed from a Christian point of view will put the flag at the foot of the cross. Christian nationalism wants to drape the cross over them, right? So, so is, is God serving your country, the sponsor of your country, or are you as a Christian operating wherever you are and, and having a loyalty but not your primary loyalty uh, to your country over God. Yeah, you know, both of you mentioned the the area of sort of ambiguity that seems to attend our conception of Christian nationalism. And Vince, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, uh, according to many descriptions, there almost seems to be an overlay of white supremacy that accompanies uh, many of the attitudes of Christian nationalism. Uh, but you pointed out in some of your writings that there's actually, in, in some cases, even in African-American churches, some Christian nationalist assumptions, and would love to get your thoughts on uh, what is, how does race play in to, our, to Christian nationalist assumptions or ideas? Sure. I think one of the things that is important to note is that uh, there are a lot of people, I mean, Martin Luther King said he thought the United States was a Christian nation. Now, what he meant by Christian nation and what people are talking about to the Christian nationalism now are not the same thing. What King meant was this is a country with a Judeo-Christian background and that out of that background, that this has something to do with being a country that's recognizing liberty for all persons. And are you willing to live up to that? So he wants to put the Constitution in front of people and say, is this really equality for everyone? Or are you saying it's only equality for some? Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think uh, when it comes to, I would say contemporary Christian nationalism, which uh, is, is I think the, the thing that's more uh, the, the, the challenge, I would say it's disproportionately white, but not exclusively white, right? So if you look at the surveys, I bet you'll see that there are people of varying, American citizens of various backgrounds who will have some of the, this complex of ideas or commitments, but it's largely uh, associated with people that, that are predominantly white. That said, um, I think it's it's the case that it's, it's an oversimplification to conflate mm -hmm. white supremacy and white nationalism with Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the particular reasons for that is probably the great majority of people that are Christian nationalists are even necessarily people that might even use that label to describe themselves, right? I think they have by having unwitting commitment to God sort of sponsoring America, but they may not recognize it as sponsorship. Whereas there are people who have some of the same ideas that are uh, talking about uh, Christian nationalism and uh, or rather white supremacy. And for them, being a white nationalist includes the idea of being Christian as sort of part of the heritage, or et cetera. So I think it's important to, to distinguish those things. I think the moment that we're in makes it easy to confuse those things, particularly because it you get more rewarded for, be, for being you know, incendiary and inflammatory. And, and, and that's one of the ways I think uh, that, that that can happen too easily. Uh, Mark, let me ask you about uh, how this movement sort of developed in that, you know, in some ways, I think there might be a similar challenge with conspiracy, you know, conspiracy theorists rarely think they're conspiracy theorists, they you know, think they have uncovered the truth. I'm betting Christian nationalists 
don't really think of themselves as Christian nationalists. You know, they they see this as a you know a coherent approach to public life. So I'd love to ask you kind of where does the movement come from? You know, what are sort of the intellectual uh, antecedents? Were some of these ideas held by founders? And you know, in particular, as the the author of the scandal of the evangelical mind, which looked at uh, strains of anti intellectualism within uh, evangelicalism, does that strain uh, play a role in, um, in Christian nationalism? Yes, um, I'm a historian and therefore a coward about a lot of current events. So I'm gonna let Vince handle the immediate origins of, of what we're talking about today. But I think historically it's very clear that American Christian nationalism that surfaced in various ways throughout American history begins before there's the United States. It really begins with British imperial Protestantism in the colonial wars between Britain and France in the 18th century. During those conflicts, Britons looked upon themselves as defenders of the truth, defenders of the Bible, defenders of freedom. France was everything evil, everything imaginable, particularly because in the Protestant eye, France was papal, Roman Catholic. During the American Revolution, loyalists and patriots all both treated each other as demonic, inspired by tyranny, and opposed to the Christian faith. Now, the patriots won, so their viewpoint becomes enshrined. You could say during the, the, the Civil War, North and South both treated each other as extreme examples of what honest, straight-thinking, Bible-believing people rejected. That's deep in our background. Obviously, there are things that have happened since the, the Second World War that, that political, um, ethnic, economic, that, that has stirred the pot. But the, the idea that the United States is a chosen nation imperiled by its religious and political enemies, that idea goes way back. And the anti-intellectualism part is usually these extreme views are promoted by people who are ap appealing demo democratically lowest common denominator, but who are effective users of the media. It used to be speech, newspapers, publishing books. Now it's, of course, the, the, the new social media. So older ideas fashioned in response to contemporary crises circulated by the uh, explosion of popular access in social media. I think in terms of the... Um of the, the, the contemporary uh, dimension of it. Here, here's the way I think to frame it, particularly in terms of, I guess, those people that I would say might be nationalists without knowing it, mm -hmm. is that uh, if you think about threats of secularization happening in society, and let's not kid ourselves, there have been threats of secularization, right? So, so yeah. people's experience of that, and then narratives that people hear about that leads them to to fear that something is being lost. And the way that it gets articulated is, you know, we are losing blank, fill in the blank. But the blank has something to do with what America is supposed to be properly as a country with a, a Judeo-Christian background. And I think to, to the extent that that gets intensified and people get fearful about it, then that creates a context where people again may, may say, well, well, I don't wanna lose this. And, you know, it's not always very clear the specific things that they think they're going to lose, right. but it has something to do with some idea of a country that's supposed to be a Christian, for some a explicitly Christian nation, or a nation founded on Christianity, and they think it's going to be either secular or it's going to become something else. And I think also the background of the Cold War also plays uh, a, a role in that as well. Uh, so I think that that intensification of it for some people leads them to have a nervousness about it and of course that desire that that fear makes you want to to hold on to something but what is it that you're holding on to how well can you articulate that i'm not sure that a, that a lot of the people say over 50 percent of the people that would have some kind of genuine christian nationalism that they could articulate it specifically uh in terms of like several things but there is this sense that um, am I going to lose my country to something, whatever that something is, and that country that I'm losing is this country with this Christian background? 
Yeah, but it's a great point. And I, you clearly see many signs of, you know, fear, aggrievement. And in some cases, there are, there are good reasons for um, concern, you know, in that there has been, you know, certain and encroaching secularism that has tried to sort of uh, drive expressions of faith out from the public square. Uh, so you know, given that there is both a palpable sense of danger and it's sometimes a, a valid one, um, we'll start with you on the events. What do you see as the harms to the church of Christian nationalism? I think uh, one of the biggest harms is the lack of awareness about why you believe what you believe about it, honestly. In other words, um, what are the things that are actually shaping your view or your worldview? We'll use that, that term. What are shaping your worldview about how you're seeing what the United States is in relationship to you being a Christian? Mm -hmm. And uh, are you being informed more by actually this Bible you say is your number one authority? Or are other things actually having the same level of formative influence about what you think is real and what you think ought to be uh, a priority for what God's people ought to be doing. And it winds up being, what should God's people ought to do? I think it honestly winds up operating this way. If you ask a lot of American evangelicals about what they think the interests of, what they think Christians around the world should think about public interests, they probably think, but they may not admit it, but, but deep down or passively to say, they, they believe that, well, you should care about the interests of the United States because that's good for everybody. So, so they'll prioritize that over, over something else. They may not articulate that, but, but that's kind of the way that they, that, that they feel about it because they're thinking mostly about what's happening here and not thinking about the broader reality of Christianity being a global reality than a United States reality. I'm sure maybe I would add that, that we've heard a great deal of, of, of well-researched commentary about church life the last four or five years particularly, but stretching way back actually into the late uh, 20th century, where church divisions have actually taken place because individuals in the congregation say, you can't possibly want to vote for so-and-so and be a Christian. You can't possibly want to vote for so-and-so or be for this, this or that public uh, pro platform being a Christian. And that, that's the kind of inversion that I think Vince was talking about earlier, uh, draping the flag on the cross. Christian people are going to disagree amongst themselves about what is good for society, and sometimes those disagreements will run very deep. But Christian people here, there, everywhere, now, in the past, in the future, if they don't define themselves primarily by the universal offer of forgiveness in Christ by the gospel, are really betraying the faith. Yes, and, I, and, and on top of that, I think it is interesting to note the way that political identities are giving people the kind of meaning that really religious identities ought to give them. I mean, if you think about it, there's nothing in the Bible about modern political liberalism or about modern Democratic or Republican parties. So why would anybody think that being a Republican or being a Democrat is like the first marker of whether you're a Christian or not? Yet, there are people who absolutely say, I don't see how anybody who is a Christian could possibly fill in the blank, be a Republican or be a Democrat. Well, well it's because of the, the way that there's been a, again, a really an attachment that it's a sociopolitical or cultural commitment that winds up taking on religious significance. And it's like, well, yes, public engagement, yes. I think there's a big theological argument to make for that. That's not the same thing as saying, therefore, you must be part of party X. Mm -hmm. That is a fascinating point, Vince. I'd love to dig into it just a little bit in that, um, you know, it, public engagement uh, is a good, uh, you know, we are called to love our enemies. We're called to work for justice. Uh, you know, these are both Christian principles. And um, so one of the things I would love to kind of get more of your thoughts on is like, what is the difference between, you know, advancing Christian principles in the public square, uh, leaning into really valuing that kind of work, uh, giving time to it, which is also an expression of value, and advancing or buying into Christian nationalism. I'd love to hear from both of you on that, sure. but we'll start with this. Sure. I think, I think the first thing is um, actually being able to understand how your faith is the basis for your public engagement. What, in other words, is it simply a kind of intuition? You just kind of feel like you should be able to do it. Or you grew up in the United States where you have a level of political agency that most people haven't had in world history. And you just assume that 
well, this is something we can do and I'm a Christian and maybe I should sort of kind of figure out how to do this. And, mm -hmm. and, and so in other words, there isn't the argument or people aren't being formed in, the, in their churches in a way that tells them, here's why what you believe leads you to have public responsibility, whether it's say, because this is a version of the second grace commandment, loving your neighbor yourself, or as part of the cultural mandate, the you know, first page of the Bible about having the stewardship of the entirety of creation. They might not know any of that, but, but, but you sort of absorb by kind of osmosis this idea that this is what you ought to be doing. And so you can't, but, but it's like, okay, well, why? And then when you get there, what determines your priorities? So what, what is it about what you believe that is orienting you towards your political commitments? And to me, I think that's less clear. I think, I think it's, it's, it's more vacant. Then, and then those other commitments, I think, wind up being what inform why people have uh, th those uh, political values. I think the danger is when one does, as a Christian, think, let's say go, you, you pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you wind up with a kind of belief that, or arriving at a belief, and again, maybe it happened by osmosis, maybe you didn't study and arrive at it, but you believe that we're supposed to be establishing God's kingdom on earth because we pray for the kingdom to come. To which my response is, nobody sees clearly enough to articulate public policy with a level of specificity about what the kingdom is going to look like. So that's a big danger because you wind up being, you know, this word triumphalism, this idea that I will tell you exactly what the kingdom of God is, exactly what it looks like. And if we do that through certain things culturally and certain things politically, then we will have arrived at what the kingdom of God is. Well, if Paul sees through the glass darkly, I'm sure we do as well. So I don't think that we can really be so certain about that. So triumphalism is a danger about presuming we know much more than we can possibly know about the specificity of kingdom realities in public. I think I've been, what I would have to say merely compliments what uh, Vince has to say, but it would involve a shout out to one of the sponsors today. Um, the Center for Public Justice is a sponsor of this, along with a couple other organizations. And its um, task, it's given itself over the last, I don't know, 40 or 50 years to, to the notion that political responsibility takes thorough thinking through how you move from a biblical basis to the sorts of things Vince was talking about. In other words, intuitional um, uh, politics based on simple assumptions about what should be, uh, uh, political positions based upon uh, a rousing appeal for fundraising or activity in the public square is almost bound to be damaging or ineffective if it's not rooted in something that we could call biblical theological or uh, a, a, a contextual understanding of how belief in Christ as the savior of myself and the world should be translated into public life. And CPJ and a number of other groups have said, you must think through the meaning of politics. You must think through what is possible and not possible, particularly in a democratic society, if there's going to be a Christian witness with integrity as opposed to just spasmodic Christian shouts. Yes. Right, and, and just one thing, let me add that real quickly is, I think part of the problem is, is that most people do not think about the entire political process and how long it takes to go from some idea about what a policy might be to actually that policy being implemented. As, as I've heard some people say, they, 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 they want politics to be like the fire station. I know it's there, but I only want to know you're there when it's an emergency. So they only think about public policy when it's, it's a, an emergency policy. In other words, when there's a cause for alarm. And then they pay attention to it. And so they're not thinking consistently about the overall and, and long-term process of political action. And of course, the danger with that is, is that there are people who do. <laughs> and, and they are putting their nose to the grindstone and being involved in the long process and they are the ones who are putting smaller as opposed to, and, and larger things uh, into practice in terms of public policy. So there needs to be at least some Christians paying more attention to the, you know, the long game of politics rather than just the, uh, you know, the call the fire station approach to politics. 
Well, let me ask you, we'll start with you, Vince, like how one does that. Uh, you know, we do see through a glass darkly, and yet there are things that require urgency. There are real injustices that need to be addressed. Uh, those Christians who are involved in politics or, you know, cultural efforts, there are certain tried and true techniques and best practices uh, that, you know, usually lend themselves to stoking uh, concern, if not fear, a sense of urgency. Um, the things that you know, are the levers where political action uh, takes place. So, um, you know, Vince, you have literally written the book on um, what it means to be a political disciple and a, uh, a theology of public life. How does one kind of uh, engage and pursue that kind of theology amidst you know, the, own, the, the constraints of our politics and um, you know, the, six, the success of techniques that essentially work on the fallenness of human nature. Sure. Uh, one thing I, I would honestly recommend to everyone is uh, a curriculum uh, that CPJ has that's a political discipleship curriculum that basically reacquaints people with the way that our political system works. Uh, and it brings together people who are different from each other to sort of reacquaint themselves with that and to uh, learn to choose an issue and to learn about this issue and to think about how to meet, how to pursue some kind of attention to that issue. And the, the, the idea is ultimately to culminate with meeting with hopefully a local representative, whether, whether, you know, whether it's someone in your town or whether it's all the way to someone who, who's in Congress, depending upon who you're able to, to meet with. And so the point is that you are then learning how to be participating in the system itself. So that's one thing that, that I would recommend. So Center for Public Justice, political discipleship curriculum, that's one of the ways to do it. Uh, when people are doing that, I, I would say the first thing is, is to recognize that one, lower your expectations about what you're going to accomplish politically because you're not going to fully establish the kingdom of God. And so set that part aside while still you know, prioritizing the fact that as a Christian, you have a unique opportunity in a country like this one to use your political agency as a way to look, to look for, to express neighbor love. So what are things that you're interested in where you see antagonism to neighbor love, antagonism to human flourishing? And is there some issue locally, something in your state, something in your town that you care about? And then, and then I would say, turn your attention to that in terms of a very direct type of engagement. If people aren't doing that, then I would say at least one, try to vote at least, at least every four years, at least try to vote or every two years because of midterm elections, at least try to do that and do that in an informed way. But doing it in an informed way where, again, you're not just voting for one or two issues and your expectation isn't just about whether a person is, is only going to be a, a, a one issue type of person because they don't only, most of the work they're doing isn't going to be just on that one issue. So are you going to pay attention to more of what a person is doing? And I, I understand that's a very hard thing to do when there's an avalanche of information that are coming at people all the time. But we have the opportunity to actually be involved in helping hopefully good candidates to get to office. I think a second thing is, of course, some people should think about whether they should actually perhaps participate at the local level, mm -hmm. be a part of the school board. Maybe, maybe you know, someone who, who's watching right now, maybe you want to run for mayor. Okay, well, go ahead and think about trying to do that, you know, <laughs> or think about being involved in the party apparatus uh, of, of that, that goes on uh, in, in, in your county, you know, in, in your town. Th those are all different ways that I think that people can begin to get involved because there are possibilities in, in the democracy, in the Republic that, that we have. So, so that's the, the, the biggest thing that I would want to encourage. So the shorthand of it is put your antenna up and see what's already out there for participation because the possibilities for participation are already there. I think the problem is that most people, they, you know, they know that somebody's going to take care of the streets getting paid. Somebody's going to take, take care of deciding when a street gets expanded from two lanes to four lanes. All these different things that, that are decisions that people get made that are political decisions, actually. They're used to somebody just taking care of those. So 
for the most part, they're not in the crisis, enough of a crisis mode to actually feel like they need to pay that much attention to it. As long as it's not too bad, it's all right, right? So I think, you know, well, maybe try to dial up the attention a little bit more. <laughs> Start there is what I'd want to say. I think I, I would add that uh, in part, it's mostly from listening to political people who are astute like Vince and others that from a Christian angle, trying to discern what are major themes in the scriptures, major themes in, in the history of Christianity to propel public action is the place to begin. Not uh, responding piecemeal to things that s seem particularly pressing right now, but trying to think throughout the length and breadth of scripture about what it is that God requires faithful servants to, to do. And, and, and we could talk about a number of particular areas, but it does seem to me that one of the things that comes through time and time again, particularly in the New Testament, is the idea that if I'm defending something that affects me, that can be good and proper and necessary, but the Christians are called, the belief, true believers, true followers of Christ are called to be as concerned or more concerned about injury to others yeah. and injury to myself. And that seems a, a pretty clear Bible principle that won't tell you how to vote on a minimum wage of $15, but we'll give you a perspective on how to evaluate your own participation in public life and how to evaluate the participation of other people. And, and I add to the word that I think what's also part of that is our disposition towards people and the populace in general. In other words, one, if I'm committed to the to a particular truth, the fact that, that, that I'm right doesn't give me the right to lie in order to support the truth and and it doesn't give me the right to be condescending and dehumanizing of people with whom i disagree i don't have you know I'm, it's, it's, my, it's my call to love my neighbors and so that i and, and it's my call to do the hard things like forgive people that offend me uh and those are hard things but that christian commitment means i need to be the person that says uh, I'm not going to, you know, play dirty, or I'm not going to lie about people, or I'm not going to um, use rhetoric that is disrespectful to people, uh, just because of my political commitments. So I think that disposition is very important. Yeah, we're going to go to questions from our viewers in just a second. But before we do so, one of the things that sort of strikes me is some of the involvement that you both have just been talking about, you know, pertains to the nitty gritty local level, you know, on a, you know, getting one's hands dirty, you know, the hard work of making the, the trains run on time. And, um, you know, it, it's very kind of close to the community. And of course, so much of our political engagement now is a much more uh, sort of a spectator, tribal kind of sport uh, that's you know based on national politics and rooting for one's team. Uh, and, and while there are a few patriot churches you know in uh, the United States, for the most part, uh, that kind of politicization is not coming from the pulpit. Um, there's a different sort of catechesis that's going on uh, in terms of media that uh, one may consume, uh, messages one hears, you know, that, that aims to sort of mobilize um, into that kind of tribal display. And I'd love to get both, both of your thoughts on what both churches, you know, church leaders, pastors, as well as interested parishioners can do to, um, you know, both encourage a more biblically grounded catechesis of um, Christian public and political engagement, and, and also for you know, people in their own individual capacities who may recognize like, you know, I, I think my media diet might be skewed in some way. Are there resources that they should go to? And we'll start with you on that one, Mark. Sure, and, and uh, I think it's often easy from the ivory tower to tell people what to do in an ideal world. And actually, sometimes the ideas from the ivory tower are, are good ones. Mm -hmm. So you, you've described, I think, in brief, the kind of silo situation we have for communications and, and media. That might be a, uh, I think it's happened at all times and places, but it's intensified in our time and place because of the dominance of social media and then the, the uh, plethora of 
sites that are object and sources of information. It would seem to me that, that uh, in the churches, it would be always beneficial to have more than one Christian viewpoint when it comes to uh, an adult ed class, a young people's class, looking at public uh, service. How would you do this simply? Well, you have an issue, you read Sojourner's Magazine, and you read First Things Magazine. And you're going to get different points of view from a Christian angle as, as to the particular issue. In the broader public, the silo effect, I think, which you've talked about, is magnifying the voices on the extreme, a point Vince made, made earlier. If, like ourselves, we tend to watch the PBS NewsHour, maybe I should occasionally watch Fox News to find out a different angle and watch not just to criticize, not just to be on my high horse and say, oh, those idiots don't understand anything, but actually listening as if they might have something to inform me that I need to be informed about. So somehow getting out of your own echo chamber and hearing other voices and remembering always <clears throat> that voices exist from people who are made in the image of God and thereby have dignity. Uh, two things I would say. One is uh, just kind of following a look what Mark was just saying is actually interacting with people that aren't just the people you're used to interacting with. Mm -hmm. right? And if your church is big enough, no, are, can your church arrange opportunities for people just to get to know each other mm -hmm. and, and, and to learn about each other's lives? I think one of the biggest problems is, this includes the secular reality as well, that people don't know actually that much about the people about whom they seem to have omniscience. And so, so for example, you know, how many people in Silicon Valley actually know an evangelical Christian and have had a conversation with them rather than being sure what they think they know about what an evangelical Christian stands for? Mm -hmm. uh, so similarly, you know, even within a church, uh, I think most of these churches are going to have a diversity of people around, uh, you know, whether they admit how much they, different they vote about things is another thing. But there's enough diversity for them to actually get together, have conversations and just learn about each other and be curious about each other, find out about other people's experiences. Because a lot of times what happens is people don't really know that actually what some people are talking about is actually based in truth, right? So some people might think, well, nobody who's a Christian really gets persecuted like you know, in their office or whatever. It's, it's like, well, actually it depends on the company you work for. It depends upon you know what, what what's happening in your workspace. It might be a situation where you 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 are at a disadvantage because because of that. But similarly, though, th there are a lot of people. You know, this goes back to the race thing, Cherie. Actually, there are a lot of people. They actually do not know about the life experiences of non-whites if they're if, if they're in the majority culture, mm -hmm. and they are what uh, as someone from the Ferguson Commission said at a, an event we had here at Wheaton. They're actually sincerely oblivious about the lives of other people. They, they, they have nice intentions, but they don't really know because they haven't interacted with people what their lives are actually like. And so the only way that that's gonna happen is actually spending the time together and, 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 and majoring on having a uh, sense of humility and, and a listening ear and being more, uh, asking more questions rather than uh, sharing more information. I think that's one of the biggest things that needs to happen. The second thing I think is a major catechesis point, which is, is teaching people that their beliefs actually do orient them to their ethical practice. We have this split between our theology, what we, what we confess, and our ethics, what we practice, and they're not often very connected. The ethics winds up being very, a very ad hoc type of things like, oh, there's a crisis. Let me sort of figure out maybe how a Christian ought to address it. The question ought to be is, how is my how are my beliefs already orienting me to live in a particular way? How's it orienting me to think about how I'm participating in this world, to, to perceive the world that I'm in and to be faithful in this world? And I think that that you know taking our beliefs into action and, and doing that explicitly is one of the most important dimensions of formation that needs to happen. That's great. Well, the questions are pouring in. And just as a quick reminder to our viewers, you can not only ask a question, but you can also like a question. And that helps us get an idea of what some of the most popular questions are. 
And it will be no surprise to either of you that a lot of the questions try to dig down into more definitional specificity. So uh, I'll kind of combine a few of those and toss them out to you. Uh, Harry Lewis asks, will you please distinguish between a patriotic Christian uh, and a Christian nationalist? Uh, Julia Rich asks, is not Christian nationalism an oxymoron? Uh, nationalism suggests an overriding attachment to a geographical area. To me, this is antithetical to Christianity's call for the world. And then Clifford Humphrey asks, what's the difference between classical Christian political thought, which includes civil support for a religion in a Christian society, and Christian nationalism as discussed here. So that's all sorts of definitional questions kind of lumped together. And uh, Mark, why don't you take the first swing at those? Right. Uh, yes, uh, definitions are really, really important. Uh, one of the strands often in contemporary Christian nationalism is, is the idea that the United States is particularly chosen by God, has been particularly blessed by God, and has a particularly rich heritage that is now under really serious threat. In my way of thinking, <clears throat> it's important to say two things about that supposition. First, there has been a great deal of good accomplished by Christian people in the United States and actually in the United States and the world. But secondly, the notion of a unique, singular relationship, covenant even between God and the United States, in my view, is a heresy. After the coming of Christ, all nations are on a level as potential instruments for building the kingdom, but, all, but never to take the place of Old Testament Israel, or never to take the place of the, of the worldwide church that enjoys the special blessing of God and has been commissioned to bring in the kingdom. So a very specific example, if uh, you are inclined to believe that the United States is unique because of God's relationship to the United States. This to me is Christian nationalism, or at least live will become Christian nationalism. And it's an idea that believers should repudiate. So, uh, and to, and patriotism, I would say, uh, just to go along with what Mark said, is the way that, you know, if you think about Jeremiah, even in exile, they are, they, they are to seek the good of the place where they are. So, Wherever you are geographically, then you know you should seek the good and, and, and care for that place, the good for that place, for its people, etc. But that does not mean to worship that place, uh, nor, nor does it mean to, in a way, really make that place kind of that's more in the place of God and God's some kind of you know spiritual servant of, of, of that place. So I, so I think that, that that's an important thing, because I think proper patriotism is, is an important thing. It's, it's, it's one of the ways of thinking about how do I seek the good of where I am? But patriotism also, I think, properly enables you to care enough about the place where you are that you actually love it enough to tell the truth about how it's failed to live up to its aspirations. And it's really OK to have a narrative where you tell the truth about not living up to your aspirations. And of all people, the people that ought to be willing to do that ought to be Christians because they believe that sin is real. And, and, and even traditions that believe, you know, in a very optimistic view of sanctification, even those traditions believe that humans are, tend to be sinful, which means what should your expectation be about the accumulative effects of all that sin in the trajectory and the history of any nation? It's not going to be one where you're seeing, wow, look at how the kingdom of God was arriving. Really, you, you should not be surprised at all the ways that history confirms that sin is a reality from the individual level all the way up to the national level. So a patriot's a person that ought to be able to admit that and not be afraid of that. And actually, that that's a reason for them to want to say, well, how do we love God better? How do we love neighbor better? Because of the ways that we failed to love neighbor in our history. I think that that that's the I think the way to do it. Whereas I think a Christian nationalist is nervous that if you criticize the history at all, that it means that somehow you are disloyal to the nation. And just to add one thing to what Mark said about the heresy piece, I think it is interesting to observe that, or it's it's curious, I guess, to observe that anyone who thinks that the, the United States is mentioned in the Bible 
which is because the United States is in the Western Hemisphere, is missing what the Bible talks about because the Western Hemisphere isn't mentioned, except for all the earth and the nations, perhaps. That's about the only coverage that we're getting. So for us to be a special nation appointed by God would seem to require a certain kind of special revelation that occurred that the Bible does not seem to suggest was coming down the road, especially after the time of Christ. So our next question comes from Werner Mischke, and Werner asks, sometimes I observe that pluralism really scares Christians. Is pluralism a Christian ideal? Can you discuss this? Uh, Mark, toss that one to you. Is pluralism a Christian ideal? Uh, yes and no, of course. That's the academic answer. Yes and no. Yes, because that's the situation of the New Testament in which the Christian faith was established, in which the, uh, the, the very best examples of Christian proclamation were carried out. I would add that for most of the world today, vibrant, active, forceful, evangelistic Christian movements are operating already in a pluralistic situation. So what might be no? It's possible to imagine a society in which individual and group Christian activity has brought about a consensus on what is good in the society. And in those circumstances, you would be restricting pluralism. Very extreme example. It's not just Christian, but a general human history believes it's wrong to kill people. Um, you don't want a society in which there are different views about whether it's wrong to kill people. You want a society in which there is a unified view that's wrong to kill people. That's, that undercuts pluralism. There have been in US history other much more detailed beliefs that were thought to be common. Not, some of those now have been challenged in the last 50, 100 years. But when, when a society has a consensus, there, there should be really no real problem with some, with some restrictions on pluralism. That's, however, not the case in the world today. It wasn't the case in the, in the formative uh, decades, centuries of the Christian faith. So I think pluralism is probably what Christian people should get along with and, and uh, figure out how to act in as best as they can. Yes, and I think one of the things that people are concerned about, the fear that maybe the, the is part of the question uh, or is raised as part of the question um, is, you know, some people understand pluralism to mean uh, a view of things where there is no truth. In other words, sort of kind of a radical postmodern, everything. So pluralism is relativism, right? In other words, that there's nothing objective, there is no truth. And, you know, whatever your truth is, whatever works for you, as long as you, as long as you don't kill anybody, hey, let's all live and let live. And, and, then, you, and then you just kind of have this way of living together. And that if, if that's the world that you have, then um, if you want to say that there is a reason for not killing people, that there is a reason for having various forms of justice that emerges out of, say, a faith tradition, then a kind of pluralism that would say, no, that's not allowed because, you know, you stand for something, right? And, that, and so I think that there are people who have that concern about a, a pluralism, which is sort of a you know, I mean, it, it doesn't really exist because some because somebody's worldview is always going to be running the show. But but the, but but the the specter of there being a, a a sort of public that where there's all views are equal or or there is no truth, and if that and what what that leads to then is um, opening the door to suppressing the influence of Christians in society. So I think some people when they think about pluralism, that's what they hear. Right. They don't hear, for example, that if you're a country like ours that talks about liberty of all people, pluralism means that you care not just about the religious freedom of Christians, but the religious freedom of, say, Zoroastrians, as well as Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims, etc. So, you know, those are two different ways of thinking about what's going on with pluralism. Right. So, so I, I think the question always has to be, well, which pluralism are you talking about? We have a few questions from pastors, and I want to combine a couple of them. And uh, Vince, I think I'll toss this to you first. Dan Jacobson asks, 
as a pastor in a quote, patriotic community, what encouragements would you have to help me shepherd my community towards biblical fidelity without triggering political backlash where I lose the opportunity for gospel ministry? And similarly, David Brenner asked, how can pastors and church leaders better engage their congregations around living faithfully with the past, being careful with history and applying it well to our understanding of God's work in the world? Sure. Uh, in both cases, uh, and hey, Dan, uh, it was the Dan Jacobs that I know. Um, I, the first thing I would say is, I think, you know, again, go back to what, what is it that people already believe? Right. So if you if you already believe certain things about, and again, this is very basic. Jesus said the two greatest commandments are love God and love neighbor. Do you really believe that? And are you encouraging people to really believe that? Because of one, if you really believe that you love God above all, which is a positive way of saying have no other gods before me, is your faith always a faith that is willing to put into check even your patriotism? Because and, and then if it's not. The question is, why are you getting upset because I'm saying that God says you should ask questions about your country and whether your loyalty is rising to worship? Because, because, because then you've got an idolatry problem on your hands. So I think, but, 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 this, I mean, but that, that's like arguably Christianity 101, have no other gods before me. So starting with something like that, I, mean, it's got, I think low-hanging fruit is the way to go. Love your neighbor as yourself. The, the thought experiment that I like to do with my students sometimes is to say, have you ever had somebody at a family gathering uh, introduce you to somebody else and you didn't like the story they told about you? You know, and, and everybody, everybody thought, oh, look, so now we really know what you are. And everybody's content with knowing what you think is a distorted version of who you are. Now, you don't like it when people do that, right? It's like, okay, well, are you willing to consider whether you do that to other people? And are you willing to engage other people to learn about them and to hear from them rather than to already be sure you know what you, you, you know plenty about them and have them sized up? And my point is, is that it's one of the ways of saying, look, what's going to be my disposition towards people where I know even within my own church, much less outside of my church, there's a lot that I don't know about anybody here. And how am I going to treat them like I would want to be treated where I don't become, you know, an exemplar of intentional misunderstanding of people, but really lots of intentional curiosity about people as an expression of neighbor love. And so I think starting with those kinds of things can begin to orient people towards saying, well, what are some of the ways we can love God and neighbor and become known for that? I mean, and, and, and of course, I think another thing if you, from a vision point of view to, to put in front of a congregation is to say, you know, um, at least in the current state of affairs, if you're, in, if you're somewhat associated with that word evangelical right now, you don't have a good public reputation. But good news is supposed to be our reputation. Hey, you know a way we can be good news people? Is people actually discover we actually really care about them and want to get to know them and see good for them and that we win them over just by being curious about them. That'd be very interesting because then people say, well, wait, how come you're not like all these other people flaming each other on social media all the time? So in other words, I think that kind of formation, mm -hmm. I think, which emerges out of just the two basic commitments about love of God and neighbor is a way to start. And then of course, I of course want to go deeper in terms of what the what, what other, what, what are the other things that you're already saying? What, what, what's already part of your common vocabulary? Those are the things to start with, because then you're not introducing something. You're saying, we already talked about this. This is already the way that, that, we, that, that this is on the books for us. We preach about this all the time. What does it really mean to put that into practice? That's the way I think to do it without people thinking, oh, I know what you're doing. You know, they're raising suspicion. No, you're saying it's right here. What we, we, we preach all the time. So let's actually, you know, do this with integrity and go deeper into what we, are, what we already say. I have a lot of sympathy for pastors who, who um, which is almost universal today, will have in their congregation people who, who have not necessarily Christian national, but very strong views politically, which make it difficult to address from the pulpit um, mm -hmm. the reasons why they are so at each other's, yeah. so different. 
But preachers have the, uh, the great privilege of being expounders of the word of God. And if people are, if pastors are preaching regularly through the scriptures, they'll, they'll be called upon to talk about the passages in the Old Testament where Israel is told to welcome strangers. Passages in the book of Isaiah about the, the, the day of the Lord when the nations will come into Israel. Passages uh, where, where Jesus uh, instructs his disciples to go to the, those who are not of, of Israel. Philip um, ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch um, in the book of Revelation, right toward the end of the Bible, where the kings of the earth bring their treasures. And a, a pastor can't afford to be uh, commenting upon the, on the, so the local school board election, or, or certainly not the, 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 the many of the great uh, political issues of our day, but a pastor can be inculcating the principles of, of the word of God. And then on the history question, good ministers select illustrations carefully. In evangelical churches, it'd be great to have a minister who could point to a David Brainerd for certain spiritual things but then point to say a Frederick Douglass who had, to, who had to struggle to learn to read the Bible because his slave master thought teaching African-Americans to learn the Bible would make them dangerous. Douglass becomes a great critic of what he calls the false Christianity in America, but really he's, a, he's in many ways an exemplary Christian person in, into his old age. So be, be, being, determined and, and smashing people over the head when you think they must do something different is not the way to go. Subtlety, not a great American quality, but subtlety, scripture, careful historical examples may help. So we have a number of questions that are sort of either pushing back or pushing in, and I'll combine a few. And um, Vince is the ethicist on this call. I think I'll direct this to you first. Uh, so we have one question. Do you not believe that Christians have an obligation to create a society that gets as many people to heaven as possible? And cannot the government help in this? For instance, the government could not or should not, uh, could or could not ban pornography. Surely we should ban it. And the banning is rooted in essentially Christian principles. We've had other uh, several questions about abortion uh, as well. And similarly, Eva Napier asked, what would you say is the appropriate biblical response to encroaching secularism in our nation? Rather than the fear of Christian nationalism, what's the alternate movement? So I would love to hear from both of you on that, but Vince, we'll start with you. Uh, sure, well, what I would say in, in about any issue is, well, first of all, is that one, um, in most of Christian history, right, uh, at least since Constantine, it's been a very checkered record. <laughs> with how Christians have done in, in emerging Christian commitments with political life. Now, there's a picture of a, a certain Dutch prime minister from the Netherlands in my office, okay, named Abraham Kuyper, okay, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on the books about people being engaged in public life, but I'm also aware of the tip of, of the ways that it can go wrong, and, and my point about that is, so when we talk about, yes, what should we make possible, you know, to the extent that we can facilitate, you know, things that enable uh, the possibility of sharing our faith, we should do that. But I think we also need to understand that, um, what, what, as I understand, especially what we're being taught in the New Testament, and, and I'm not saying this in, with, that it's in lots of discontinuity with the old, but what we're being taught in the New Testament is not the idea that mission is going to happen because I get enough of the right laws passed. Mission is going to happen because of the faithfulness of God's people and their witness, no matter whether whether the, they are in situations more like a first Peter situation where you have basically no religious capital, no social capital, no, no political capital, but you do have an opportunity to truly be a witness that raises the question about why are you people not the problem that we thought you would be. So, so you have that kind of situation. Uh, and, and I think it's important to say that when, you, when you're in a situation like the one we're in in the United States, the question is, I think, how, if I'm talking about religious freedom, how am I going to do that in a way where it's clear that my reason for doing this is because, not just because I want people to be converted, but because 
it gives me the opportunity to worship and to 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 form people and if i form those people if churches form those people then you have people who are committed to the good of all persons and not only to christians in other words that whether people are getting converted or not christians are committed to seeking the good of those people and is that the kind of country that i'm trying to facilitate i think that's the thing that that we should be thinking about so i'm all i'm, I'm all for saying we ought to be in the game of public policy and, and, and seeking the good. Um, but, but I think we also have to be thinking about, okay, what, what's our ultimate expectation about what we're gonna be able to accomplish through political means. Political means uh, are not necessarily what God needs in order for people to get converted, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a political system that leads to conversion. I mean, it's the work of God in people's hearts. So that, that can happen whether you're in a situation of oppression uh, or not. Uh, in terms of, of you know, laws, et cetera. I mean, we're in a country where you have the opportunity to participate in seeking public policy. The question is, in a pluralistic society that talks about freedom of expression, how do you want to have your own freedom of expression protected mm -hmm. while also saying, here's why other forms of expression are ones that ought to have limits on them? What kind of argument are you making to people that aren't Christians? or to people that are not well-informed Christians. How are you doing that in ways that um, are going to be convincing to them? So what? So how are you going to translate Christian commitment into a key that people can at least begin to understand? In terms of abortion, what I would say is, are you willing to be pro-life from womb to tomb? You know, from, from all the way to conception to once somebody's been born. And are you then, are you also committed to the flourishing of people, not just so they're able to, you know, make it out of the womb, but once they've made it out of the womb, are you committed to a society that seeks to do as best as it can to facilitate the conditions for people to exercise their agency and to then pursue their opportunities for flourishing? Or is, is that this kind of society that you're committed to? So it can't just be about abortion because, okay, a lot of poor kids get born, then what? They're, 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 they're in bad neighborhoods, with bad school systems, with minimal economic opportunities. And the question is, how are we facilitating the transformation of those contexts? How are we coming alongside there? To, again, to facilitate the agency of the people, not to coddle anybody, et cetera, but how are you facilitating that so that people are able to enter into the possibilities of flourishing, to even have a vision of flourishing if they tend to be born into context where there isn't much of a vision to flourish. So what is happening in terms of what are being pro-life in that way? So we have to, yes, definitely, all the factors that lead to people talking about terminating pregnancies, you know, in my, in my view, with the exception of, you know, life of the mother type of situations, then, you know, what, what, what about once the children are born? Mm -hmm. What about the, those realities? So are, are we entering into ways to, to facilitate flourishing there? I would only add, uh, with, uh, agree, <clears throat> agreeing with events on a particular issue of pro-life, that pro-life means something very comprehensive. And if, it, if it's not comprehensive, it probably isn't really uh, pro-life. But then I would add that if in our democracy, the kind of broad, far-reaching sort of arguments that Vince has just laid out are not effective, it does not mean that the gospel witness must cease. In the post-World War II era, the Christian faith has grown more rapidly in the People's Republic of China, which has always had legal abortion than anywhere in the world. Should China move in a pro-life direction? In my view, yes. Is that move essential for the progress of the gospel? No. So our next question I'm going to toss to you, uh, Mark, as the historian on this call. Rick Berry asks, electoral slash pol partisan politics tends to operate within a fairly short historical memory, as opposed to Christianity, which tries to orient us within the entire story of human history. How have you seen Christians or Christian communities successfully foster a deeper and longer relationship to history? And how has fostering a longer term perspective on history changed their posture in politics now? Right, uh, uh, fostering a, a longer term perspective on, on history 
I, I think would allow people in the United States to realize that uh, uh, religiously motivated argumentation can sometimes lead to flourishing society. I'm thinking of, of the campaign against slavery, for example, which in Britain was more successful earlier than in the United States, but was motivated not exclusively by Christian people, conservative Christian people, but mainly by uh, uh, Christian people. And, and uh, people who know that history know that it took a long time to move from the first attacks on the slave trade to the elimination of slavery. So that lesson is a good lesson and how hanging in there for a long time can be really useful. At the same token, that same period of history saw the strengthening in the United States of the notion in the North, white North as well as the white South, that somehow the Bible legitimated uh, slavery. And that argument, looking at how that argument developed over time, it brings some caution to how in, entrenched notions, and there it was the assumption that black people were simply or, ordained for slavery, assumptions building up over time that lead in, in a wrong direction. But in both cases, it's necessary to take the longer purview. Now, how to do that? Well, I'm not a magician, so I, I, I'm not sure, but encourage people to read. Uh, again, pastors, select illustrations that push you and your congregation out of, out of your comfort zone. Try to have an awareness of points of view that reinforce what you think, but at least a few that, that go against what you think. It's a long struggle. The, the, I've not done a nearly as good a job at, with providing an answer as framing the question, but it's a, real que a really good question that demands a lot of thought and a lot of careful work. So we also have a lot of practical questions uh, and I'm going to combine two and Vince is the ethicist concerned with praxis. Maybe you can start us off here. Uh, Maureen McKnight asks, in a society that is increasingly losing the ability to respect differing points of view, how can we restore the basic respect that will make dialogue possible even among Christians? And Marilyn McIntyre asks, if you are fully persuaded on what you believe to be credible evidence that a particular news outlet is, per, what, what they're purveying is not only distorted, but false and harmful, hate mongering, for instance, why would you be obliged to listen to it with the same respect as a source that you believe has more integrity? Isn't there a time to walk away and say, as one would to a bully, I'm not listening to this, it's wrong and doesn't deserve a hearing. So two different questions about essentially how, how then do we navigate this? Right. Uh, to, to the second question, I would say, yes, sometimes that's what you do, right? But I also would say it depends upon uh, what's my reason for watching the other things and learning about the other things, because I may think that a particular news outlet is largely, you know, uh, propaganda, let's say. Uh, well, um, I think if, if, if there are people that you're, that you know, that you, with whom you want to converse that are, you believe, uh, under the sway of this propaganda, one of the ways to actually converse with them is to know what they're listening to, right? Which doesn't mean that you have to have a steady diet of listening to it all the time, but having some familiarity with it and understanding the way that they're hearing, that they, that they are getting the news, I think that, that can be important. That can at least facilitate a conversation with the person that you know that primarily gets their source from there. Because that, that's because somebody says, well, somebody watches blank news outlet 10 hours a day, right? Okay, well, I need to have some idea what's happening, what, what, what they're hearing 10 hours a day. I don't have to listen to it 10 hours a day myself, but if I'm going to, I think, engage them with integrity, it helps me to be informed about that. So, so I think, so it, it depends upon, I would say your purpose for, you know, uh, exposing yourself more broadly to the different outlets. Um, uh, to to uh, the prior question, remind me of the prior question, I got caught up in, in that piece. I just wanna make sure that I answer it correctly. Yes, um, it, a society that's increasingly losing the uh, ability to respect different ah, points of right, view. Right. How can we make uh, restore the basic respect that make a dialogue sure. possible even among Christians? Sure. Uh, I think the first thing is to, is to look in the mirror. It's the first thing that I need to do and ask. Okay, 
what are my, the things within myself that need to be transformed? What are the things within myself that make it hard for me to be charitable to people with whom I disagree? How do I tend to think about them? How do I tend to categorize them? Do I think about them as three-dimensional people or do I think about them in terms of what their tweets are, right? Or, or whatever their other kind of sloganing might, might be, right? So I think that's one of the things I have to do is, is first start with myself. But then I would want to say that hopefully the communities of which we are a part, you know, can we introduce ways of beginning to have discourse with each other and in, and in those conversations with each other or orient each other to say, listen, when we're de dealing with people outside of our circles, are we willing to be the people that want to respectfully engage other people and not get drawn into it? And I think part of that also means perhaps, you know, learning how to moderate one's engagement with a lot of what happens with social media. You know, I, I don't think I'm the only one who has perhaps gone on Twitter and at one point you found yourself thinking, okay, why do I feel like my emotions are going in a not so good direction right now, right? So and the point being, well, maybe that means take a break and it's really okay to not be in the sea of tweets and you know, Instagram feeds and, uh, and other things. So I think that, that there's, there's that piece of it as well. The biggest thing I would say about it though is, are we orienting ourselves to be people that say, I want to be characterized by militant respect for other people, irrespective of whatever their disposition is toward me. And, and, and are we forming our communities to have those kinds of people? Because that, I think that, that's the way that's going to start. Now, people who are like big influencer people, if you're able to have people who follow you because of what you say, then what I would say in your case is, then you become the model and have a campaign about respect everybody but really mean it. Not conveniently respect everybody, but actually respect everybody. That, that's what I would say. Mark and Vince, as we close out our time together, I'd love to give each of you the last word. So Vince, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, so what, what I would say, you know, uh, in political disciple mode is that if you are a Christian, then your first loyalty is to God alone. If you love God above all, you can have the space to have to, to be open your open yourself to be a person where God can question you about your commitments and in questioning you about your commitments it's you know that can include how are you loving your nation how are and and how are you loving other things and if, if we're really those people with that first commitment to God and our trust is in God who is saving us because our nation does not save us then you know our trust ought to be in him and displayed in our love of neighbor and I would just encourage all of us to think about, you know, what are new ways I can imagine to love my neighbors, especially the neighbors that don't think like me. Being asked to think about Christian nationalism has led me to two historical conclusions and one theological conclusion. First, the Western Christian heritage has given great gifts to the history of the United States. The rule of law, the, the strength imparted by traditional families, the importance of personal moral responsibility. But secondly, churches passively or actively have done a great deal to undermine, have been complicit in undermining these great gifts. The theological point is, especially in a democracy where we're encouraged to bring our values into the public space, Christian believers should always remember that even political opponents are made in the image of God, even political opponents are those for whom Christ died. Vince and Mark, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure and an honor to be with you. Thank, thank you to each of you who have joined us. Have a great week.